you have your Bibles, you could turn with me in them to the book of Amos. Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. This is uh, our first message in Amos. We begin a new series in this Old Testament book this evening. Preaching through this book has been a desire of my heart for some time. To that end, I am excited to see what God will do with it over the course of the months that are to come. I always, at the beginning of any series, preach through a book sermon. Now, of course, not, not a topical series, but topical series don't come along all that often uh, here. I'll do a little mini-series from time to time within a series. Um, but other than that, we're mostly walking through books, and I begin with a book series, I have found, or a book sermon. I found it, these book sermons to be very helpful. Uh, they have a tendency to give us a broader view, allow us to see the forest, so that when we get w into the trees and the nitty-gritty of everything, we don't lose the forest for the trees. We know where we're going. We know what is, uh, is being said. We know the direction that God is trending with these exhortations. And Amos is a book that is unique. It is a book of correction. Uh, it's a book of warning, of judgment, and also, as is not just common, but as is actually um, universal among the prophets, uh, the book uh, will end, as they all do, with hope with a promise of deliverance in the latter end. And we begin by setting up where we find ourselves in the Bible. Then we'll talk about the historical setting of Amos, and then we'll start walking through, in a very summary fashion, the contents of the book. So the order and structure of the Old Testament scriptures is both organized and deliberate. There are 39 books in the Old Testament, and they are broken up into three primary sections. The first 17 books of the Bible are books of history, and these are broken into two sections, one of five books, and another of 12 books. The beginning five books, the Torah, the Pentateuch, the law, uh, various names for it. This describes God's creation of the world all the way to the establishment of Israel as a nation. Then we have the 12 books of the history of Israel itself as a nation. The first nine of those books record the years of Israel's history from the conquering of Canaan all the way to the Babylonian exile. And then the final three of those books record events that took place after the exile. Following those 17 books of history, we are given five books of poetry, books that are sometimes called the wisdom literature. These five books comprise Jewish hymns and proverbs for worship and direction. The other side of those five books are another 17 books, this time not of history, but of prophecy. And once again, these are broken into sections of five and section of 12, the five major prophets, and then the 12 being called the minor prophets. Now, they are not classified as minor because of their importance, but they are classified as minor because of their relative size and scope. And as with the, the final 12 books of history, the final 12 books of prophecy are the same. Nine of them deal with uh, that which took place before the exile, and the final three are after the exile. Now, as we look at the major prophets, uh, Ezekiel and Daniel are exilic books. Ezekiel is by the river Kibar near Babylon, and of course Daniel is in Babylon. Uh, so we see those within the scope of the Babylonian captivity. So in this, we have a beautiful symmetry, right, of the organization of the Old Testament books, which, if nothing else, does help us organize our minds uh, as it relates to how the structure of the, of the Old Testament is laid out. It's not laid out chronologically. It's laid out thematically. Now, within those 17 books of history, it is laid out relatively chron chronologically, as well as those 17 books of prophecy relatively chronologically as well with those five wisdom, poetry, praise books in between. Now, today we find ourselves entering into the prophecies of Amos, the 30th book within the Old Testament. 
Now, and one more thing I'd like to summarize before we dig into the text proper, laying the foundation for our understanding of that which we're stepping into as it relates to history. We'll find as we walk through the prophecies of Amos that he is speaking primarily to the northern nation of Israel. And this is as contrasted with or, or distinct from the southern nation of Judah. It was in the days of Rehoboam, who was the son of Solomon, that the nation of Israel split into two independent countries. This split saw 10 of the 13 tribes of Israel break away from the kingly line of David and form a new kingdom, which was called Israel. Pastor, you just said 13 tribes. I thought there were 12 tribes. Well, recall that the tribe of Joseph actually broke into two distinct and individual tribes. Those would be the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. And that covered the birthright or the blessing uh, that uh, um, Israel laid upon his sons. And so because Levi would end up not getting an inheritance in the land because his inheritance was the Lord, there were still 12 distinct breakups of, of land in Israel based upon that double uh, tribal split between Ephraim and Manasseh, the two sons of Joseph, each getting a full inheritance in Israel so that effectively there are 13 tribes more or less that we're actually dealing with uh, as we deal with um, with the nation of Israel. That being said, there are times where Joseph is spoken of as one tribe, um, but for, throughout the vast majority of the scriptures, we are talking about Ephraim and Manasseh uniquely and individually, though they are both from that, uh, that son of Israel named Joseph. So the, the, the 10 tribes, with the exception of Judah and Benjamin, split into a nation that went into the north called Israel. This was first under the line of the king Jeroboam. And then that gave way to the line of Omri. And then finally to the line of Jehu. Now the capital of the kingdom of Israel would be the city of Samaria. Jeroboam soon cast off faithful worship, if you recall the account there. And he fell back into a hybrid worship system that was reminiscent of the golden calf worship that we could study from Israel's exodus out of Egypt when Moses was up on Mount Sinai receiving the law and Aaron fashioned a calf of gold and said, these be thy gods, O Israel, that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Jeroboam, in fact, says those exact words when he forges two golden calves, puts one at the south end in Bethel and one at the north end in Dan and compels all of the northern tribes of Israel to worship this golden calf as the Lord. Now, they did retain many of the traditions of Israel, but it was a hybridized system with the pagan lands that were around them and with this kind of superstitious golden calf worship type idea um, that, that we find in the days of, of Jeroboam. Now, in the days of Omri, this switched entirely over to Baal worship, particularly in the days of Ahab, whose wife, Jezebel, was a prophetess of Baal. But then Jehu comes along and he destroys the house of Omri and he actually rolls back that system, gets rid of the prophets of Baal, as he was commissioned to do, but he didn't bring them back to Jehovah worship. He brought them back to golden calf worship. And so we find this hybrid worship system that is there in the north. Kept many of the traditions of the laws of Moses, but intermingled them with a great deal of pagan worship as well. Now that's the north. In the south, Benjamin and Judah remained loyal specifically to the line of David. This would be the prophetic line, the line that 2 Samuel 14, tell, uh, 7, 14, excuse me, tells us was the prophetic and the promised line through whom Messiah would come. They also retained the city of Jerusalem as its capital. Now, throughout all of the prophets, you will often find God speaking about Samaria and, and representing the entire northern tribes of Israel with Samaria and the southern tribes of Israel with Jerusalem. So that when God is speaking of the people of Jerusalem and such, he is speaking to the southern tribes or the southern nation of Judah. And then when he's speaking of Samaria, he's speaking of the northern nation of Israel. In 2 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 14, the Bible tells us that the majority of the Levites who lived in northern Israel actually uh, migrated down to Judah when Jeroboam began his golden calf worship so that we would understand that the vast majority of the Levitical line also was living in Judah for those years of the divided kingdom. 
To that end, we find that while the minor, or excuse me, the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, were all men of Judah and were speaking primarily to Judah because the functional point of, of the, the major prophets is to prophesy of Messiah and to, to, to show God's plan related to Messiah. So Judah's going to be the line because that's the line of David through Judah. Several of the pre-exilic minor prophets were sent to prophesy to the northern kingdom of Israel. And Amos is one of those prophets. He is unique among those prophets in that he was actually from the south and sent to the north. We have no other prophet of which that can be said. And so with those foundations in, in, in laid down, let's go ahead and jump into the text. And as is typical, the book begins with an introduction. And we find this introduction in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1, where we read this. The words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, when he, what she saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, the Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the habitations of the shepherd shall mourn and the top of Carmel shall wither. The text begins by introducing us to its author, a man named Amos. Unlike some of the other prophets, Amos is mentioned nowhere else in the Bible except here in the prophecy that bears his name. He was, as I mentioned, born in the southern kingdom of Judah in a somewhat well-known city called Tekoa. As it relates to cities that are outside the big ones, um, this is one that is quite well-known. It's situated about five miles south of Bethlehem, about 10 miles from Jerusalem. 2 Samuel 14, verse 2, tells us of a wise woman from Tekoa that would be instrumental in reconciling David and Absalom, at least for a brief time. We also find Tekoa mentioned in 2 Samuel 23, verse 26, one of David's mighty men, in fact, was from this city of Tekoa. Amos, however, as it relates to men of Tekoa, was no such man of stature. He was a herdman. Amos describes more about himself in chapter 7 of his prophecy, saying to one of the priests of Bethel that he was not a prophet, nor was he the son of a prophet. He was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. But God raised up Amos to leave his land, to leave his profession, in order that he might give a message to Israel. Amos also tells us that he is a prophet in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, and Jeroboam, the son of Joash, the king of Israel. And he mentions that this message was given to him two years before the earthquake. Now, we know little of this exact earthquake. We're aware of several earthquakes that took place within the scope of those years of the kings. The only thing that we know is that it happened in the years overlapping the reigns of Uzziah, and Jeroboam the second. And we have covered already the fact that the kingdom of Israel had split into these two nations in the days of Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Obviously, the Jeroboam of that day, the Jeroboam of the, the days of the split is not the Jeroboam we're talking about here in Amos. We're many hundreds of years down the line from that Jeroboam. This is a Jeroboam that we would regularly call Jeroboam the second. And this Jeroboam lived at the same time as Uzziah, a man who's also called in the scriptures Azariah. We find that Uzziah reigned 52 years over Judah, likely from somewhere around 783 BC to 731 BC. Uzziah is known as one of the great and godly kings of Judah's history, though it did not end well for him. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 26 that in those final days of Uzziah, he lifted himself up in pride and in this fit of pride, he sought to enter into the temple and to burn incense on the altar. This was an act that was reserved for the priests alone. They stood against him. He disregarded them and he sought to do this thing. We, we do not have any uh, insight into why exactly it was that he chose to do this thing. And many believe it was in response to this great breach of obedience that God brought that earthquake upon the land. There's nothing in the Bible that says such. 
We know that there was a great earthquake in the days of Uzziah. Many speculate that it was in response to his great sin. The scriptures tell us that Uzziah left the temple stricken by God with leprosy on that day that he would never recover from until the day of his death. To that end, if the earthquake was indeed at the same time as that transgression, Amos is prophesying here toward the end of Uzziah's reign. And if you recall, early on in Isaiah's reign, in Isaiah chapter 6, it begins with, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon his throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So we recognize that there would be some overlap there as well, that Amos is ministering in these days of Uzziah. If he was ministering toward the end of those days, then there would have been at least some semblance of overlap between his ministry and the ministry of Isaiah the prophet. Of course, these are somewhat speculative. The king that's actually more important to us, however, within the scope of Amos' prophecy, is the king of Israel since Amos is being sent to the northern nation of Israel. And this is Jeroboam II. Jeroboam II came into power after his father had done much to push back the power of Syria over the region. We're going to be talking about Syria next week and a man named Hazael. We're actually going to be coming up to him not too long, uh, hence in uh, Sunday school as well, uh, in these early pages of 2 Kings that we're studying right now. Jeroboam II also had a long reign. He reigned a full 40 years in, in Israel, and his reign is often considered to be one of the, the, really the apex of Israel's influence and wealth in the world. It was after a time of successful conquering, of reclaiming Israel's land. It was a time where they were wealthy and when there was a great deal of progress happening. Uh, and a part of that, of course, was also Uzziah, who was very, very wealthy and successful in Judah. And with that wealth, there came a major increase in the standard of living in the land. And this is actually a major part of the focus of Amos' prophecy, his early prophecies toward the nation. The whole nation was not increased together, the Bible tells us. But rather, this increase was defined by a, a broadening gap between the haves and the have-nots in society so that it will be stated by Amos that the wealthy increased specifically through their abuse of the impoverished in the land. And this is going to be one of the things that we will think on and contemplate as we walk through the book of Amos, is the natural progression of a people when they become wealthy. We see this as well in various books such as Ezekiel, where Ezekiel 16 talks about the sin of Sodom. And if we were to identify that sin, of course, we recognize that the outworking of that sin was in that, 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 that thing that we call sodomy. But that the thing that compelled them unto this end, unto such sexual perversion, was actually that, if I may paraphrase it, they were rich, fat, and lazy. And we happen to live in a very similar circumstance today where we have an abundance of time, we have an abundance of leisure, we have an abundance of material wealth, and that does something to a people. So as we walk through the book of Amos, we're going to see what that abundance of time, that abundance of wealth, and that abundance of leisure did to the nation of Israel. And we're going to be able to consider through it the ramifications on them, the ramifications on our own people today, and it might help us to learn a little bit better the manner in which we can be praying for our people, for our nation, for our culture in the midst of our own struggles with this thing which we would call a blessing, but which has always tended a nation toward, well, depravity. If we look at history and we are, are willing to learn from it. And that brings us to verse 2. The Bible says, And he said, The Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the habitations of the shepherds shall mourn, and the top of Carmel shall wither. If verse 1 gave us the setting for the prophecy, verse 2 sets the tone. The Lord will roar from Zion 
and utter his voice from Jerusalem. We'll dig into that more deeply next week as we actually walk through verse by verse and we'll come back to verses one and two. But suffice it to say, the theme of this book is that God is very angry. And Israel is going to experience his wrath. God begins, however, by declaring not his wrath upon Israel, but upon the nations that are round about her. So that the remaining verses of chapter 1 and into the beginning of chapter 2, they are dedicated to God's wrath upon the nations around Israel. It begins with Damascus. Then it speaks of Gaza. Now, Damascus, it's not a nation. It's a capital. It's the capital of Syria. Gaza, not a nation. It was the primary city of the Philistines, right? So we're not, we're not looking at the nations broadly in, in listing the names here as much as he's speaking to the capital cities or the major cities within these regions that represented their nation. So once again, when we think of Samaria, when we think of Jerusalem, we're talking about the whole nation boiled down to their capital in the same way that we would talk about uh, um, uh, St. Paul or we talk about uh, Washington, D.C., and that would be representative of the state of the nation. So we see Damascus, we see Gaza, then we'll talk about Tyrus, then we'll talk about Edom, then Ammon, then Moab. And then finally, in chapter 2, just before speaking of Israel, God will also speak of the transgressions of Judah and of the palaces of Jerusalem. Those transgressions, of course, we can go to other books of the Bible to see more fully, specifically in this time, Isaiah would be the place to go to study that if you wanted to at the same time. Through these pronouncements, Israel is reminded that God has not forgotten about the unrighteousness of those that are around them. But then as we get to chapter 2, beginning in verse 6, God takes that microscope and he plants it squarely on Israel for the next many chapters. Verse 6 of chapter 2 all the way to the end of chapter 5 will be entirely about God's judgments upon Israel and the reasons for doing so. So we read in Amos chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, Thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes, that pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor, and turn aside the way of the meek. And a man and his father will go into this, uh, in unto the same maid and profane my holy name. So God focuses in, as I've mentioned, on the wealth of the nation and on the results of this wealth. First, it caused them to become greedy, selfish. And in that greed, in that selfishness, it lent them to oppression. Specifically oppression of the poor heightening the disparity between the haves and the have-nots in culture, becoming more greedy and selfish as they became more prosperous. It's an irony, is it not? One would think, and in the Christian, either in the Christian sensibility, that as we become more wealthy, that ought to be, mean increased giving, increased generosity. But what we find in the human heart is that a lot of times it goes the other way. That as one becomes more increased in wealth, as one becomes more increased in goods, they become more... Exclusive, maybe miserly, even in a sense. And again, we'll talk about that more in the weeks that are to come. So it led them to become more greedy, more oppressive. And second, it led them into other manifestations of selfishness, namely into sexual perversion. Blaspheming the name of God's design in their contempt for the nature of God's intended purpose in the sexual relationship. And again, in this, we find a common template that we can trace throughout history and even into our own culture today. And we'll talk more about that later. God then highlights to Israel in the remainder of chapter two, the depth of his love for them. One of my favorite things about the prophets and specifically the minor prophets, because there's, there's a lot that's packed into a little bit of space, is that God always goes out of his way to affirm and to reaffirm his deep love for his people. And in this, it also highlights the contempt that their actions have shown toward his love. So we read in Amos chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, Yet, I destroyed, yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height 
was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath. Also I brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. And I raised up of your sons for prophets and of your young men for Nazarites. Is it not even thus, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord? But she gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets, saying, Prophesy not. God speaks of his peculiar and particular love for them, that he did this thing for them, that he drove out the Amorite and he put them in his place. And then he raised up Nazarites, those who, who, would, who would dedicate themselves to the Lord. And he would raise up prophets, those who would speak in the name of the Lord. And God says, How did you repay me? He repays me, repaid me by giving the Nazarites wine to drink, which was a breaking of their vows. And you repaid me by telling these prophets whom I raised up not to speak. Again, we'll have a lot to say when we get to Amos chapter 2 on this point. In light of Israel's contempt for God, God promised that he would bring upon them judgment. Describing this in Amos chapter 3, verse 14. He says that in the day that I shall visit the transgressions of Israel upon him, I will also visit the altars of Bethel and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. He says that he will visit the transgressions of Israel upon them. Israel will reap what she has sown. And in that she has sown corruption, she will reap destruction. We always reap what we sow. In Amos 4, God makes it clear that this visitation of judgment has no means been because God has not been patient. It's not because God has not sought to bring them back in his love. You know, much of the world misunderstands God today. They see God to be an angry God, especially the God of the Old Testament, right? Who, by the way, is the same God as the New Testament God. Not a different God. Not different in character, not different in intent. Same God, Old Testament, New Testament. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, forever. And more or less, most people today associate the nature of God with the nature of judgment. And indeed, God is holy. God is just. So that Amos writes in Amos 5.24, a, a well-known verse, but let judgment run down as waters and righteousness is a mighty stream. When judgment is upon a man or a nation, that judgment falls like a flood. Righteousness pours over men and nations alike and consumes all that is in its path. But take note of this too, Christian, that before judgment, there is always, always long-suffering and mercy. There is a day that the cup of God's mercy overflows into judgment, but that cup is indeed deep. As fundamental as holiness and righteousness are to God's character, so too is his long-suffering. So that before we come to Amos chapter 5, verse 24, where God says, let judgment run down as waters and righteousness is a mighty stream, we read this in Amos chapter 4, verses 6 through 11. And I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and want of bread in all of your places. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord." And also I have withholden the rain from you when there were yet three months to the harvest. And I caused it to rain upon one city and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon and the piece whereupon it rained not withered. So two or three cities wandered into one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased. The palmer worm devoured them. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with the sword and have taken away your horses. And I have made the stink of your camps to come up unto your nostrils. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And ye were as a firebrand plucked out of burning. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Time and time again, God was patient. He brought minor judgments. He showed them that he was displeased. And time and time again, they returned not unto him. And God says, now time is up. 
God began that slow and incremental process of small judgments meant to get their attention, and with each one they hardened their heart more than the last, until judgment had to run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. To this end, in chapter 5, God warns that they should not be looking forward to the day of the Lord. For he says, the day of the Lord for you will be darkness and not light. But the day of the Lord is a day of redemption for those that love God. It's a day of terror for the rebellious. Now, in our final chapter of Amos's direct prophecy, we find an interesting shift in perspective. So we read in Amos chapter 6, verse 1, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion, and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations, to whom the house of Israel came. Here we see Amos step back and look not only at northern Israel, uh, whose capital was Samaria, but also at southern Judah, whose capital was Jerusalem, that rested on Mount Zion, so is often called Zion. Amos speaks to both capitals, saying, Woe to any of either mountain who are at ease, who are trusting in their own riches, their own power, their own situation. For indeed, all who trust in themselves will one day find themselves lacking. And all who trust in the Lord, well, as Isaiah tells us, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And this leads us to the final three chapters of Amos where Amos sees a series of visions about which he and the Lord interact. In Amos 7, verse 2, Amos sees a vision of destruction upon the nations of Israel and also of Judah. And with each vision, Amos intercedes for God's mercy. And God shows that mercy in these visions. Amos then sees a vision of a plumb line. Amos chapter 7, verse 8 the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Then said the Lord, behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. Amos is reminded that though God is merciful, that there is still a standard. We'll talk about what a plumb line is and why this matters so much when we get there. There is a standard. And God has a standard. And that all men must live up to that standard there to avoid the judgment of God. Now, this will be a point where we, outside of simply studying the historical visions that Amos saw here, will be able to fall back upon our reminders of the mercy and grace of God as Jesus has taken our judgment in himself. So that we are reminded that though there, was, there is indeed a plumb line, that Jesus has plumbed that line for us. And all who are in Christ meet that standard, not in ourselves, but in the one who died for us. And of course, we'll get there when we get there. In Amos 8, we see another vision, one of a basket full of summer fruit. The picture is of a final harvest before the end of the season. And in this, God sets the mind of Amos and his readers to a farther time, to a time much ahead, to a time that is called the latter days. A time when, according to the end of the chapter, God will send a famine in the land, not of bread, but of the word of God. When there will be no vision and no prophecy. And this carries over into the final prophecy in Amos 9. A vision of the Lord standing upon the altar and striking the lintel of the door until the post shake, declaring the destruction upon de declaring destruction, excuse me, upon the people of Israel, and scattering them to every nation. A destruction of sinful people with the sword. But as with every prophecy, so too with this one. In the days following this scattering and this destruction there is another promise made of which we read in Amos 9, verses 13 to 15. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed, and the mountain shall drop sweet wine and the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof they shall also make gardens 
and eat the fruit thereof. And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. In the words of Paul in Romans chapter 11, God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. His mercy will yet fall, not just upon the tribe of Judah, the Judites, the Jews, in the sense of that southern tribe, but a reunited Israel in a time when he will gather them in order that he might redeem them and he will give them salvation. This speaks of days well yet future. Well, maybe not well yet for us. Well yet future in their day, not per, 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 perhaps right around the corner for us today when the nation of Israel will be regathered into their land and they will believe on the name of Jesus Christ to be saved and enter into the kingdom that was prepared for them. Of which, of course, we will have much more to say in the months to come. And of this broad overview of the book of Amos, from which we draw a few applications as we close this evening. Application number one that I would like us to think through as we think of us. Let us not scorn the one who loved us. One of the broad themes of Amos as it relates to his relationship, God's relationship with Israel, is that they had scorned the love of God who had done so much for them. Israel had heaped contempt upon the God of their salvation, not as much in word as in deed. They had all the right words. Going all the way back to Jeroboam, they kept the right words. That golden calf, they worshipped. They worshipped in the name of Jehovah. They kept feasts. They kept traditions. But for all of those things that they kept, what they gave away was righteousness. Christian, it is easy. I'll use the word cheap to talk kindly of the God who sent his son to die on the cross for us. It's easy. We ought to speak well of God. But what God wants is our obedience. God doesn't want our words. He wants our obedience. We find this in James 1. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For beholdeth his, himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Paul would say in 2 Corinthians that we cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. And this is exactly what Israel had sought to do. To claim the loyalty of God and loyalty to God while perverting his vows his prophets, his laws, his altar. And God forbid that we should do the same. God forbid that we should joyfully continue in sin that grace may abound. God forbid that we should willingly present ourselves clean on the outside while being uh, filthy on the inside. And God forbid that our loyalty and love for God would be only skin deep. To live in such a manner is to heap contempt upon the sacrifice which Jesus made for our sins. And while such contempt is commonplace among the unbelieving world, it is certainly not uncommon among those whose minds are blinded by the God of this world to heap contempt upon the things of God's word, to heap contempt upon the world's traditions or the, the church's traditions, uh, even in the manner in which they would seek to live them out in a Christianized nation such as the United States of America. Such contempt ought not be named even once among we who are called by his name. Amos is a potent reminder that God does, as, as much as God will judge the unbelievers that are around, God does not forget the sin of his children. But as we considered not long ago in our morning family series, God's love for us indeed demands that he confront our sin when we choose to rebel against him. So let us not scorn the one that we loved. And second, as we think through just this broad overview, God is our redemption, our hope, 
and our salvation. If there's any reason not to scorn the one that we love, this is the reason. As with every prophet, so too with Amos, God's promises of judgment always give way to mercy. This is one of the things that I love the most about reading the prophets. You read all of these uh, uh, promises of judgment because of the, the sin and because of the rebellion of God's people against him, but it always rolls back into mercy. And if that doesn't tell you something about our God, if that doesn't help define for you exactly what Jesus Christ did on the cross. God's promise of judgment always gives way for mercy, to mercy. And this is not intended to reduce the urgency of righteousness, but rather to compel us unto hope. Now, we know, as those who live in a New Testament economy, that Jesus has borne the wrath for our sin. As we think of the warnings against not scorning the one we loved, we are not afraid, if we have accepted Christ as our Savior, that God is going to cast us into hell, for indeed, if he did so, he would be unfaithful to the promises he has made. We rest, as those who have received this gift of salvation, in, in a place of eternal security, because Christ has borne our wrath on the cross. Israel is on a different path, and we'll talk about that in the weeks to come. God has a plan for them, and we'll try to iron that out as best we can when we get to the points of these promises. But at the end of the day, this is what we know. All those who follow God will come through Jesus Christ into his glorious kingdom. And through all of this, we will be, and indeed are reminded, of that which we call our blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Any redemption that we have, any salvation that we have, is the extension of God's mercy upon us, and that day is coming. That is our hope. That is the vision that we have before our eyes as we serve the Lord with gladness, as we seek not to scorn the one that we love, as we don't continue in sin that grace may abound. It is all unto this reason that we may hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. It is all for this reason that there's coming a day where, we are, where our blessed hope will appear and we will be redeemed, even vindicated as the case may be. And so these two applications find their way to the same place this evening. That God has reached out to us in love. And so we should not pour contempt upon him in our thoughts and in our actions. And yet it is only through his love that we have any hope of even doing this. And my prayer is that as we walk through Amos in the months to come, that we will be renewed in our appreciation both for God's mercy and for God's righteousness. That in doing so, we would be invigorated to serve him with gladness until he returns for his own. That it would help us orient ourselves as God's people rightly to God's promises. Help us orient ourselves to what God plans to do through the nation or in the nation of Israel one day. And also help orient ourselves rightly to the promises of our blessed hope and the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening to Pastor Jamin Wickler from Legacy Baptist Church in Buffalo, Minnesota. More information about Legacy Baptist Church and a library of sermons are available at www.legacybaptistchurch.net.